All right. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Special thanks to the pursers for reading the verses today. He said in the first service today, eh, we're around here for a few more months. In case you didn't know, they've got orders and they're leaving us. They're going to Nebraska in February. We're trying to hijack that in some way and start a rumor on them. So if y'all have anything, give it to me and I'll, uh, I'll pass that on. 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you're a guest today, uh, we have been walking verse by verse through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And we finish up the book today and then next Sunday I'll uh, start doing some Christmas preaching and uh, lead us right on in through the uh, Advent season. But today we land in uh, Paul's last words, these last verses of 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. And I want to just preach to you a message on the last man standing. The last man standing and hopefully that title will make sense here in just a few minutes. Uh, I pulled a book off my shelf that I have read because of some thoughts in it that have really ministered to my heart. Uh, Several years ago, I sat in a session with Pastor Wayne Cordero, uh, who went through some burnout in his life, and he had to unplug and literally go into isolation for a period of time in order to regroup and refresh and get his bearings. And so he wrote a book about leading on empty. And one of the chapters in that book, he entitled Solitary Refinement. Now, we think about solitary confinement, uh, which is where we find the Apostle Paul uh, as he's here in uh, prison. But, uh, but Wayne writes about solitary refinement in that he had to go into silence and solitude in order to have some refinement in his life. And what he talks about in this chapter is the difference between loneliness and solitude. He makes this statement, solitude is a chosen separation for refining your soul. Isolation is what you crave when you neglect the first. Now with that statement, what he he means is, is that you're going to get yourself isolated and, and in the loneliness when you don't crave the solitude of a fellowship and a relationship with God. So I want you to think with me about the Apostle Paul here in this text because I believe you really are seeing a man that is dealing with loneliness while at the same time he's in solitude. He's got a lot of time to think. He's got chains on his arms. It's not like the end of the book of Acts when he was in prison the first time because for a couple of years he he was able to receive visitors into his residence and and people were able to come and go and he was pretty much able to move around. But here uh, he is in isolation, he is in shackles and in the verses you you can feel his loneliness but you can also see a man that's in solitude who is really thinking about what God is doing uh, in his life. You know, through the years I've watched some documentaries and some shows and read a little bit about uh, people who are on death row. It's amazing to read stories and to see how people come to that moment and how they act and how they respond. They're typically given the opportunity to choose their last meal. You know, what would you like to eat before you pass away? And, and then it's, it's interesting to see their temperament or their spirit, or sometimes even their last words. Sometimes people are defiant, they're angry, maybe they're still saying they're innocent, you know, they didn't do or commit the crime that they're accused of. Others are just silent. They don't have anything to say, they won't respond, they won't even utter a word, while others are humble. I'm always grateful when I read or hear a story about someone who is at that point And then they have a testimony of how someone led them to Jesus Christ. Man, I'm always hopeful that that it's legit. You know what I mean? That that they're serious about it. And I believe God saves uh, to the uttermost, right? Even in the last moments of life. And so they're humble and they're repentant and, and they're sorry for what they have done. I have this book here in my office uh, entitled The Last Words. And it has a story after story after story of the lives of different people, the, the actual obituary of their life, of what they accomplished, some of them uh, being famous, some of them being infamous. Uh, some last words are recorded. You know, uh, those last words sometimes are very interesting. What does somebody have to say 
when they're about to draw their last breath. That's exactly what we have in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. This great man, this great pastor, church planner, and missionary, we actually have from him his last words. Now, here's what I find to be so amazing about this passage. We're not going to look at a lot of theology today. There's not a lot of doctrine in here. What we're going to see is a man of God who's just a man. He's just a man. And I believe he gives us four, I mean, important, vital principles to live our lives by. Let's look at them together, shall we? Notice in verse number 9, right off the bat, I think what, what, what I see as I read this text is that Paul reminds us that we need each other. That we need each other. Look at it. Paul says to Pastor Timothy in Ephesus, do your best to come to me soon. Timothy, please, hurry up. The expression there in the original language is hurry up. My daddy used to say, boy, don't you let any grass grow under your feet. Get to moving. Hurry up. Timothy, come. Come quickly. I want to see you. Can you... Can you feel the loneliness while at the same time can you feel the affection that Paul has for young Timothy that he's done ministry with? And he says, Timothy, I need you. I, I, I want to see you. I want to be, be with you. I want to see your face. I want to fellowship with you. Notice in verse number 11, Paul mentions Luke, that Luke is still with him. Luke has not left. Luke alone is with me. Skip down to verse number 19. You can see Paul's ministry as he's just flipping through the files in his mind, thinking about those that he has done ministry with, that he and Timothy have engaged in kingdom work with. And he says, Timothy, tell Priscilla and Aquila I said hello. Acts chapter 18, we know that they had a wonderful, wonderful ministry of discipleship. He once again mentions the household of Anesiphorus. You remember him back in chapter 1, Paul said, Timothy, you love on that bunch. You take care of that family. Very likely Onesiphorus had already passed away. But Paul said, that family, that man has refreshed me. He has encouraged me in the Lord. Anybody in the room this morning ever been going through some stuff and somebody refreshed you? You'll never forget it, right? You'll never forget it when people step into your life and pick you up and lift you up. And Paul says, Timothy, you you tell them I said hello. He mentions Erastus in verse number 20, who's only mentioned two times in the New Testament. Paul left him uh, to be in leadership at Corinth. He mentions another man named Trophimus. We see him in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 4. Uh, someone who was at Ephesus, but Paul said he got sick and I left him at Miletus. This is another sermon for another day, but that just reminds me that God allows sickness to happen, Right? Paul said, we left him there. We left him at Miletus. And then once again, verse 21, Paul says, Timothy, Timothy, do your best to come before winter. Hurry up, Timothy. It's going to be cold. Uh, Back up in uh, verse number 13, he tells him to bring his coat, right? Winter's coming. Get here as fast as you can. And then at the end of 21, he mentions four people that we have no record of. We uh, don't know from the scripture who they are, with the exception of Linus. Uh, in history, Irenaeus said that he was actually the first bishop of Rome. But here's four names included for us in the canon of scripture of people we know that Paul did ministry with and they meant a lot to him. I think God wants us to slow down today and just be reminded of how much we need each other. In ministry, in the kingdom, we we need unity. We need fellowship. F.F. Bruce, I love what he said. He said, the unity and fellowship of God's people is not a wimpy idea that weaker Christians dote on. It is an essential condition for experiencing the strength of our God. 
anybody in the room today that can testify that God's helped you lately with strength? Strength to get out of bed. Strength to go another day. Strength to make it through a problem or a crisis you found yourself in. You'd have never made it unless God gave you the strength in that moment. I remind you today that a part of receiving God's strength into our life is that we receive that from one another. God uses us in the family, in the community to lean on each other, to cry on somebody's shoulder, call somebody on the phone and say, hey, I need you to pray for me. I need, I need God's help. I need, I need you to lift. Listen to me, Christian. It is not God's plan. It is not God's design for us to be lone rangers, to live in loneliness, to live in isolation. I was reading a study the other day uh, from a group called the Plos Medicine Research Group. And they did a study and they said that 33% of Americans suffer from loneliness. Did you know you can be around people and still be lonely? You can be around people and still feel isolated. Here's what they concluded. And I have no idea how they measured this. I'm just going to tell you what they said. They said loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now we all know this. That's not good for your body, right? So they're saying loneliness is not good for your body. And you know what I want to say? I want to hack the website and I want to say, hey, here's the problem. God did not create us to be lonely. God created us to be in community and in fellowship. Hear me today, church. We need each other. You need a local community. You need a local church, a local fellowship. You need, you need, I need accountability in my life. If we're going to be effective in the kingdom, we need each other. I was in a meeting on Thursday and we were uh, at our association and we were discussing church planting in Escambia County and some of the goals that we have for the future. And I would just add, we've got some pretty lofty goals. Uh, right now there are 59 churches uh, in our association and there's a goal of having 100 churches uh, by the year 2030. Pastor John had the blessing of going to that meeting with me. And as we were sitting there, we were looking at statistics of this county and I want you to hear me today. We need every Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. We need them all. And we need more. Unfortunately, we fall into the mentality and the trap that, oh, we're in the South, there's a church every 15 feet. That might be true, but that doesn't mean that every one of those churches are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. On top of this, hear this, in Escambia County, 231,000 people live in our county. This is not to brag, but this is just the statistics. Our association is the largest denomination in this county. And right now, on a given Sunday, there are about 9,000 people attending our churches. 9,000. Now what does that tell you? There are some other churches, obviously, that are reaching people, but if you add all the gospel-preaching, Bible-believing churches in our town together, and I praise God for all of them in our tribe and outside of our tribe, but if you add them all together and put them in a big pot, we still got a big lost county that needs Jesus. And we're never going to do it. We can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. We need each other. The family of God in this day and time, instead of chunking bricks at each other, needs to join hands and realize that the hour is urgent and we need to lean on each other. So we can't do it in loneliness. We can't do it in isolation. We need to come together. So Paul just really has helped me this week. It may not help you today, but Paul's helped me this week remind me that we need each other. Let me notice the second thing with you very quickly. Paul teaches us here that in gospel kingdom work, Everyone won't stick around. Everyone won't stick around. There are some people who will come in and they will go out. He says in verse 10, For Demas, in love 
with this present world has deserted me. He's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. We don't know one thing about this dude, except Paul wrote that he went to Galatia. Only time he's mentioned in the Bible. We have no historical record. We just know that there was some type of ministry work that Paul had for him, and he went to Galatia. As a matter of fact, we don't even know where Galatia is. We just know that God put him in the Word, all right? Kingdom work. And then Titus, you recognize him, the next book in the Bible. Titus goes from Crete to Dalmatia. So they're out. They're out on the mission field, right? And he says in verse 11, there again, Luke alone is with me. He's the only one left who's close by. He's a traveler who stayed with Paul. And then he says, Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you. For he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus, I sent him to Ephesus. And that's in that third missionary journey. Very likely, Tychicus is the one that delivered the mail. In your Bible, the book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians, those letters arrived to those churches by the mailman Tychicus. Paul says, I sent him to Ephesus. Timothy, when you come, verse 13, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. We have no idea who Carpus is, except he had Paul's coat. Timothy, also bring the books and bring the parchments. Now, what I want you to see here is this is so important. Man, I'm telling y'all, y'all might not get anything out of this sermon, but this passage has helped me this week. In the ministry, in the kingdom work, not everybody's going to stick around. Not everybody's going to stick around. For Demas, bless his heart, nobody names their son Demas. Maybe your hamster or your dog. But, but nobody names her. You know why? Because Demas automatically in the Bible is known as the person who walked away. Who walked away. There's really not a lot of debate over whether or not Demas, you know, was a Christian. Most likely he was. But he got to a point in his life because of situations where he walked away. Now, now Paul mentioned Mark there a minute ago. You may remember back in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas got ready to head out on their second missionary journey. And Barnabas said, come on, Mark, we're heading out. And Paul said, oh, no, 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 no. No, he's not going with us. Barnabas, what? He's not going, nope, he's not going with us. And when I preached through the book of Acts, I got into all of that, you know, why? And, and a lot of scholars say maybe that, that, that John Mark just wasn't tough enough. Uh, he wasn't ready for the journey ahead Uh, He had proven that he wasn't strong enough. Some scholars even say that John Mark wanted to get back to Jerusalem because he was a mama's boy. It's not a problem. That's not a problem. Paul just said, hey, you're just not ready. You're just not ready now. But I love this here. It's so beautiful. Paul has gotten reports that John Mark has grown up, that he's matured. Uh, You know, in the message, not by an email, but... In the message trail, somehow it made it to him that that John Mark is still doing the work of the ministry. Can't you see this old preacher here in prison as he says to Timothy, Timothy, I want to look that young man in the face. He's very useful to the ministry. And then he mentions the different ones that he had sent out and placed in certain places. Church, this is so important. I heard someone say several years ago that most churches are more focused on their seating capacity than their sending capacity. We're more focused on our seating capacity than our sending capacity. How many of you believe that a local New Testament Bible-believing church should be focused on sending people? Let me tell you something. Three years ago, we sent some of the best people in this church to Alberta. Faithful, serving, loyal. Did we need them? Absolutely. Were they hard workers? Absolutely. Do we miss them? Absolutely. But you know what? There was a mission that our church needed to be on. And so we needed to send some people out. This church needs to be ready to send people to the far mission field. Mike and Anna Cole, where they're sending church. Missionaries to Togo, Africa. 
They've said, we'll go, we'll go. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is not just a place, a club to collect people, to just sit and stagnate. No, the church is a living, breathing place to where we send people out. We need to celebrate. We need to celebrate when some go, when some go to reach the world. And we need to, we need to be heavy in our hearts when we see those like Demas who say, nope, no, nope, I'm too much in love with the world. How many of you know that every single one of us are candidates to be that way? I promise you, your heart this week and your heart this coming week, you are going to battle every day over whether you love Jesus more than you love the things of this world. It's going to be a constant battle. Oh, John, the Apostle John, shuffling around the church at Ephesus, probably 90 years of age. They say he would shuffle around, kind of slumped over, and he would constantly say to the Christians there around the church, my little children love one another. My little children love one another. My little children love one another. John was the apostle of love, but he had something else to say about love in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We are all candidates to drift away. Let me give you another statistic. Are you ready for this? In 2018, the average church attendance in that same group of 59 churches was 12,200. Three years later, the average attendance is 9,000. So let me ask you a question. Where's that other 25%? If you look at the national average, and, and it's not everyone. It's not every single person, but if you look at the national average of what they're telling us over the last 18 months, the devil has used what we have been through to take people away from the community, the body of Christ. And they're telling us that 20 to 30 percent of church attenders are gone and they're not coming back. Now I'm going to tell you that grieves me. You know why it grieves me? It grieves me because I know everybody's not going to stay, but it also grieves me because I know of how much we need each other. God designed it this way, church. He designed it that we would be together. So, so let me just challenge you here to stay connected, right? And if you get disconnected, let it be because of the mission that God has called us to, not because we love the world more than the things of God. The third thing I see in this text that I've learned, man, this has been so good for my heart and my soul. In verses 14 and 15, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you got to watch for the wolves. You got to watch for the wolves. Anybody read through the book of Acts and you get back there toward the end or chapter 20 and Paul's about to leave Ephesus? And he says to Timothy, Timothy, I'm fixing to head out and I want you to know as soon as I leave, you better have your eyes open and you better be looking for, he used the word, wolves, who are going to come into the church and they're going to cause division. Division doctrinally. They're going to they're upset the apple cart. They're going to they're going to cause the discipleship of the church to be disruptive. And you better watch out because they love to prey on the weak. They want to carry the weak away. And Paul mentions a man he's already mentioned. In chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, you may remember, he said there were two men in the church that he had turned over to Satan. What were their names? Hymenaeus and Alexander. Alexander, look in verse 14. He says to Timothy, Timothy, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. Now, I don't have time for this, but 
If you do a little reading on this, here's what you'll find. A lot of historians and scholars believe that Alexander, of course, Paul said, I turned him over to Satan. He was dismissed from the church. What happened to him? What did he do? There are some that believe that Alexander focused in on Paul almost with an attitude of, I want to destroy him, and I'm going to get him if it's the last thing I do. And there are some that believe Alexander followed Paul all the way to Troas, which is where he was arrested. That's where he left his coat. And they believe that Alexander was the person there that was saying to the governmental authorities and the people around, hey, this guy is a troublemaker. This guy, everywhere he goes, he's upsetting governments and cities and the synagogues. And he's just pointing the finger, pointing the finger. And he might have even had a part in Paul's arrest at Troas. So Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, this is a bad dude. And I want you to know that he strongly opposed the message. He strongly opposed the message. Now what does that mean? The work that Alexander was doing, he was actually fighting against the mission and the gospel being spread. You better be alert, Timothy. You better be alert. Notice verse 15. Beware of him yourself. That word beware there is a defensive measure. Guard yourself. Be on the lookout. Have discernment. Because... He'll get you too. Through the years in ministry, there's been a few times where, you know, you got your guard up and you go, man, something's just not right. You you keep your attention up. How many of you believe that the elders and the leaders of the church are supposed to work at protecting the church from wolves? That's exactly what Paul's telling Timothy here. Let me give you the last thing, and this is my favorite part. If you haven't been listening so far, listen now, all right? I love verse 16 through verse 18. Paul reminds me, he reminds us today, he reminds Timothy that Jesus is our rescuer. Jesus is our rescuer. He's our deliverer. Notice verse 16. We talked about loneliness. We talked about isolation. Paul said, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. Now here's Paul. Greatest missionary, greatest church planner. And at his first defense, Paul said, I looked around and nobody was there. Does that sound familiar when you read your Bible in the Gospels? Because what happened to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Even the disciples scurried like cockroaches. My daddy used to say to me, boy, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, in this situation, when the going gets tough, some people disappear. Some people disappear. Can, can you feel Paul's loneliness as he stands falsely accused? He's not done anything wrong. He's not killed anybody. He's not stolen anything. He's not committing a governmental insurrection. He's just preaching the gospel. And he's standing there and he looks around and none of his brothers and sisters are standing with him. They all deserted him. But I love that next phrase. I love it. Don't miss it. I love the next phrase because, again, we're reading a man's last words. He says, But may it not be charged against them. You know what? I'm getting old. I feel it every day. Can I get a witness right there? And I'm going to tell you something. I'm at this juncture in my life. I'm staring at 50. And and I'm at this juncture in my life where I, I want to die a sweet old man. I just do. I'm in this middle middle stage here where it's really critical okay so I read some books and try to study the life of a pastor and 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 so forth and 
And one of the challenges, Kerry Newhoff wrote a book, Didn't See It Coming. And in there he talks about, as a pastor, you don't see it coming, but if you're not careful, if you're not careful in ministry, all the bumps and the bruises and the attacks and the struggles, if you're not careful, it's going to make you a cynical, crusty old man that nobody wants to be around. And I just want you to know, I don't want to be that man. And I'm going to tell you something. That phrase at the end of that verse, it may not leap off of the page at you, but it leaps off the page at me. Here's a man who has been kicked and beaten and battered and falsely accused. He's been shipwrecked. He's been stoned. He's been deserted by his brothers and his sisters. He's sitting in a prison cell with shackles on his arms. And he reflects about what happens. And out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. And he says, you know what? I'm not bitter toward them. May it not be counted against them. Oh, I don't know about you, but I want to be that kind of man. Do you want to be that kind of man, that kind of lady? It's not bitter. It's not caustic. Verse 17 the last man standing, I want you to see this. Paul said, no one is standing with me. Everybody has deserted me, but I'm not mad about it. But Timothy, I want you to hear me. In the loneliest moment, the Lord. <laughs> I want to get Baptist right here. The Lord stood by me. And he strengthened me. You see, church, the last man standing, the hero of this text is not the Apostle Paul. The hero of the Bible is not man. The hero of the Bible is Jesus. The last man standing, Paul said, humanly speaking, I'm standing by myself, but I really wasn't by myself. Because the Lord was standing right beside me. And God wants me to tell you today, when you're at the loneliest moments of your life, and you feel like nobody cares, and you've been deserted and abandoned and attacked until you have no more energy, Christian, Jesus is standing by you. And Jesus will strengthen you. Why will he strengthen you? It's not about you. I hate to burst your bubble. It's not about you. Paul tells us why the Lord strengthened him. Why? Look at it, verse 17. So that, through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles may hear. You see, it's always about the mission. It's always about the salvation plan. It's always about redemption. The Lord strengthened me so that the work may be done. And he strengthened me in such a way, the end of verse 17, I was rescued from the lion's mouth. When you hear the lion's mouth, what do you think of? My mind goes to the book of Daniel, right? Yep, Daniel and the lion's den. Historically speaking, at this particular time in the Roman Empire, uh, th there was not, uh, Christians weren't thrown into a lion's den at this particular season. And so all scholars say that Paul's not talking to a moment, talking about a moment where a lion uh, was about to latch on him like Daniel, but rather he's using it as a figure of speech to say, over and over and over again, I found myself in trouble. I found myself under attack. And you know what? The Lord always rescued me from the lion's mouth. I want you to hear me, church. Hear me. That does not mean that He will always humanly rescue us from persecution and trouble. As a matter of fact, this man, this man fully knew the context of his life. He knew the calendar. He knew the clock. He knew his future because he says in verse number 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. And notice the next phrase, and bring me safely 
into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. You know, sometimes our rescue is on this side, and sometimes our rescue is on the other side. You got to focus in on his statement that he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Last week, John was in verses 1 through 8, and he read verse 6. Look back up in your Bible at verse number 6. Look back up there. It's not going to be on the screen. Look at verse 6. Paul said, For I am ready, I'm prepared to be poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. You see, Paul knew that he was checking out, he knew that he was done. And he knew this was going to be the moment where his salvation would be complete. And his last words, and I'm done, his last words are words that speak to me. Because I know myself and I know my flesh and I sort of know you and your flesh. It'd be easy to be at this moment and say, God, where are you? God, look at all that I've done for you. God, look at all the cities that I had in our church offices, the places I'm going to plant churches. Paul could have said a lot of things here, but at the end of his life, through all of his trials and heartaches and difficulties, and, and right on the eve of being beheaded, you know what's coming off of his lips? It's doxology. Praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above you heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. To Him be glory and dominion and power forever and ever. God, You're in control. And if I breathe my last breath right here, the worst thing that's going to happen to me is I'm going to open my eyes and I'm going to be with Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of life I want to live. That's the way I want to go out of here. <laughs> that way. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, as sure as God puts his children in the furnace, he will be in the furnace with them. And that's exactly what we see from Brother Paul. Now I'm going to finish up verse 22 in a minute, but I want to ask you to stand today. Verse 22 is going to be our benediction for the service. How many of you needed the reminder today that the Lord is standing beside you? The Lord's with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. No matter what comes your way. We believe that Jesus Christ, hear me, the most important thing I'm going to say today is that Jesus Christ died on the cross and when he was on the cross, he took all the sin of the world in his body on the tree. The scripture teaches us that he took our punishment. He took the wrath of God upon himself. So that to every person that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledges that we are truly a sinner, believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, confesses our sin, and confesses Him as Lord, that we're saved, we're delivered from our sin, we're born again, and now in my life, because that happened for me when I was 13 years old, now I can say to you, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done, there is no condemnation that exists for me, because I'm in Christ. If you don't know Christ today, I beg you, I plead with you. If you're confused or you've got some questions, you want somebody to help you, please, I'm begging you. Come to us after the service and let us just pray with you. If you're a man, we'll find a man, a lady, a lady. Take you in one of these rooms. Spend as much time as you need. Please don't go away without Jesus. Don't do it. Christians, you've gotten a great reminder today of how much we need each other. Amen. We need each other. We need to stand together in these days. Through the highs and the lows. Hills and the valleys. Oh, we need each other.